Greetings, Grace Baptists, and all of you who may be tuning in from your respective bunkers. Uh, we're glad that you joined us for this um, sermon. And as we begin week four of isolation, I trust that you are experiencing the goodness of our sovereign God and the comfort of his Holy Spirit, and that you are growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been praying for you as I've been praying for myself that we, like Paul, would learn in the midst of this circumstance how to be content, um, that we would know how to be brought low as well as how to abound, that in any and every circumstance we would learn the secret of contentment. I pray that our motto is, I can do all things, even and including uh, prolonged periods of social distance uh, through Christ who strengthens me. One of the primary ways that the Lord strengthens his people is through his word. And so it's a great privilege. It's a real pleasure for us to be able to uh, open the word together today. Um, I'll invite you to take your Bibles and turn it to Acts chapter 20. We'll be looking today at verses 17 to 38, and in an effort to maintain some normalcy in the midst of all kinds of uncertainty and change, uh, we're going to continue our exposition of the book of Acts, and we find ourselves today in the latter half of chapter 20. So follow along in your Bibles as I read from mine, beginning at verse 17. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among you, your own selves, will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful for, excuse me, being sorrowful most of all, because of the word he had spoken, that he would not, that they would not see his face again. 
and they accompanied him to the ship. This is the word of the Lord. What we have here is a farewell speech. In our passage last week, we, we saw um, Luke was telling us about the Apostle Paul's last night in Troas, which was spent for the most part, minus a little intermission where there was a resurrection. It was spent preaching and teaching and dialoguing with the believers of that city. And Luke had a lot to teach us in that passage. But one thing that he didn't tell us was the content of the farewell speech that Paul delivered to the saints in Troas. Well, in our passage today, Paul remedies that situation, and he gives us a real detailed um, account of the type of things that Paul would say to leaders and to churches as he was departing from their midst and going on in his missionary journey. Um, the overarching sense that you get as you read through this passage is that this, this speech, this passage, is just full of pathos. Parting is such sweet sorrow, said Juliet in Shakespeare's most famous rom trage. I think that's a category. I know rom-com is, so rom trage should be as well. And the reason that that line endures is because it has everything to do with, with how relatable it is. We, we so resonate, resonate with the bitter sweetness of goodbyes. Over the last couple of weeks, our family has been revisiting the Toy Story franchise. And uh, these are all wonderful movies, and they are eminently watchable except for the farewell scenes. For example, in Toy Story 2, there's a scene that shows the relationship between um, a young girl named Emily and her favorite toy named Jessie the Yodeling Cowgirl. And this, this scene is like a montage of their relationship through the years. And the montage ends with um, the girl... Emily, having all grown up, driving off into the sunset, and her favorite toy in a donation box on the side of the road, and all of this to a very lovely, um, sorrowful Sarah McLaughlin tune, When She Loved Me. Ouch. That, that is, that's hard to watch. And then in Toy Story 3, and I'm sorry if I'm spoiling this for any of you, but come on, you've had a couple of decades to watch these movies, so uh, it's fair game. In Toy Story 3, uh, Andy, the young boy, he, he has his favorite toy um, named Woody, and Andy has now, in that movie, all grown up, and he's on his way to go to college. And the ultimate scene of that movie is Andy driving away um, to go to college, and as he's leaving, he stops at his neighbor girl's, on um, the neighbor girl's house, and he gives her um, his favorite toy, Woody. And after initiating her into how to play properly with Woody, he um, bids goodbye and heads off for college. And let me tell you, that is excruciating to watch. It takes every bit of my willpower not to ugly cry in front of my boys and in front of my wife. And these are just cartoons, for goodness sakes. What about when you have to say goodbye in real life? When you have to go to a different school or move to a new town or bury a parent or a child? These are incredibly sorrowful and significant times. And it seems to me that the best kind of departure have um, at least two characteristics to them. And I could summarize by saying this, that these two characteristics are don't forgets and no regrets. Don't forgets and no regrets, if I could put it that way. So don't forgets are the things that, for example, Andy's mom is saying to him as he's 
walking away, getting into the car, getting ready to drive away to college. She's calling after him and reminding him of all of the things that he needs. Don't you need your jacket? Make sure you put on clean underwear, that sort of thing. These are don't forget. These are, I, this is just a quirky way, of course, to refer to uh, last words. And the last words that people speak at departure are often, almost always, the most important, the most significant things that those uh, people could think to say. Okay, this is the, the last time you're ever, this is your last opportunity to tell them. You want to tell them what is the absolute most important thing for them to know, or if they already know, to not forget. The other component to a, a good buy, as opposed to a bad buy, is no regrets. After you have left, or after someone has left you, you want to be able to have a clear conscience. You don't want to ever be in a position where you have to say, I wish I had done that, or if I could, if I could do it all over again, I would have done that, or if I could turn back time, I would say this. These two elements feature prominently in Paul's farewell address to the Ephesian elders. He is leaving them, but he's able to leave them, as he says, with a clear conscience. And he departs only after reminding them of the most important things that they need to know, the things that they must not forget. What is of utmost importance, according to the Apostle Paul, you might ask? What, what are those most important things? Well, as he says elsewhere, it is how to conduct oneself in the household of God. In other words, he, the things that Paul is most at pains to get across to people before he leaves is proper conduct in the church. Um, it, in this case, it's, it's, he, he's speaking to these elders, these church leaders, and, and Paul is going to use his example and his exhortation to describe what a faithful ministry looks like. So that is what we want to learn from the passage, the marks of a faithful ministry. These words are directed in the first place at pastors, elders, and by the way, if I could already give you a little bit of an aside here, this is one of the key texts of Scripture that, that teach us that the words pastor and elder and bishop all refer to the same office. These aren't hierarchical separate offices, but they're actually, they're just synonyms for the same leadership position in the church. And they're all interchangeable, though they have their distinct distinct um, characteristics. Um, so that is who Paul is speaking to in the first place, in the most direct sense. And so this is a sermon for me, and this is a sermon for Pastor Matt, and for our elder in training. And trust me, I've had to be confronted with the demands of this scripture all week long. I've had to preach it to myself first, and I need to hear it continually I don't, I don't consider it to be a mere coincidence that we are coming across this passage in our exposition of the book of Acts the, on the very week that I am marking my 10th year as your pastor. It was exactly 10 years ago that um, I had my first Sunday among you. And I don't think it's a coincidence that that we come to this passage. It's, it's, it's a truly humbling exercise to measure oneself against the marks of a faithful ministry as presented by Scripture. So this is for me. This is for um, any who would aspire to um, pastoral ministry in the context of a local church. But you aren't off the hook if that doesn't describe you. Because this passage is for you too. Remember, it was you, the church, who called me way back then. It's the church's responsibility to be able to recognize the marks of a faithful ministry in a potential candidate. 
It's the church's responsibility to encourage these marks from their elders, to demand them, actually, to call and affirm pastors who are demonstrating these marks of the faithful ministry. And not only that, but, but I think what you'll discover as we look into this a little deeper is that the marks of a, of a faithful ministry look an awful lot like the marks of a faithful Christian life. These could, be, these could very well be the marks of a faithful Christian life. And so there is no real distinction in what um, you and I are called to. Um, uh, you, you might consider also, just to uh, expand this point, you might also consider the fact that the qualifications for an elder or for a pastor are, are the qualifications that are exist, the expectations that exist for every cr Christian except for one, which is the ability to teach. And uh, Don Carson has said about these, um, these qualifications of, of an elder that, that the most... Um, the, the most fascinating thing about them, the most notable thing about them, is that they're not very fascinating, that they're not very noticeable, that, that, that they're not very um, extraordinary. And uh, really, these are the qualifications of all Christians. In the same way, what you'll, you'll discover is that these marks of a faithful ministry are also what ought to be characterizing every Christian life. And so let's all just learn together and let's all grow together as we look at this passage with the help of the Holy Spirit. As we look at this farewell address to see um, some marks of a faithful ministry. Now, just so you know, just so you know where we're going, uh, there are six marks of a faithful ministry that I would like to pull out from this passage. But we're only going to have time today to look at the first two. And so what I uh, hope to do, Lord willing, is to look at the remaining four over the next couple of, of weeks. And I'll, I'll kind of um, lead you through that, but you can, you can just be anticipating that. Uh, we'll look at the first two today, and Lord willing, the next four over the, the next couple of times that we're um, doing this. I'll give you all six now and then in the time that remains we will examine the first two number one serving number two sobbing number three suffering number four speaking number five shepherding and number six securing these are the marks of a faithful ministry, serving, sobbing, suffering, speaking, shepherding, securing. Let's look at the, the first mark of a faithful ministry, serving. The Christian life and ministry can be summarized best, I think, with the word service. Our calling is to serve the Lord and to serve people. And the order there is very important, just as the order is crucial when it comes to the first two greatest commands. There is a, an order and a priority there. So it's not possible to truly love your neighbor without first loving the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and strength and mind. That is the first commandment. And the second one comes out of it and is derived from it. You can't have the, the second without the first. And so too, is it impossible for us to stoop to serve others without seeing ourselves first as servants of the Lord? Paul strikes this note right off the bat as we come to this passage when after assembling the Ephesian elders, um, he's meeting the, them in Miletus as he's waiting to sail from there. He assembles these elders and he calls on them as witnesses of his posture towards them the whole time that he was among them, which is to say, and look at the beginning of verse 19, 
His posture was serving the Lord. Actually, the word translated there as serving is probably too mild of a word, too sanitized because of our American sensitivities. More literally, the word actually refers to the kind of serving that a slave would do, which is less the idea of voluntary service and, and more the idea of obligation and being duty-bound to a superior. It's clear that, that Paul recognizes himself to be the latter. He often, as he's writing letters to these congregations, describes himself as the bondservant of Christ. He, 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 he understands himself to be bound and constrained, compelled to do what he does by duty to his master, the Lord Jesus Christ. As he puts it in verse 24, Paul is engaged in a ministry that was given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw this explicitly earlier in Acts when Jesus sent Ananias to Saul, explaining, this is what Jesus says, he, that is Saul, to become Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. He is my chosen instrument. He's my servant. Now, it may not be quite as dramatic as that, but every true minister ought to recognize that he has likewise been called by God. Paul is able to say about all of these pastors in verse 28 that the Holy Spirit has made them overseers of the flock. The Holy Spirit has given them that call. And I can't help but think that understanding ourselves, first of all, as bond slaves of the risen and the reigning Lord Jesus Christ, who is Lord of the church, I can't help but think that that would radically transform how we think and how we act in ministry. And then in the second place, faithful ministry is marked by serving others. Though, let me just, let me just say right off the bat there, before we get any further than that, something that I remind you of, I think, pretty regularly, that it's probably not helpful to think about serving others in distinction from serving the Lord Jesus. I, I want you to understand the priority that we need to consider ourselves slaves of, of Christ first, but it's not helpful to think in an overly pie, pietistic sort of way. A, a very pious, um, detached sort of way that we're going to focus on serving the Lord and then maybe later we'll focus on serving others. No, Jesus teaches us in Matthew 25 that we serve him by serving others. And our calling, as, as Jesus has instructed and demonstrated throughout all of his ministry, is that we are to be serving others. Nearing the end of his ministry, Jesus showed this in the most moving and memorable way when he tied a towel around his waist and when he knelt down and washed his disciples' feet. And here's the lesson. Jesus didn't want them to miss the lesson. He doesn't want us to miss the lesson. Jesus said, If then your Lord and teacher have washed your, your feet, then you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Not specifically washing feet as a sort of ritual, but that idea of um, wrapping a towel around yourself in order to meet um, the greatest need that your brother or sister has, <coughs> excuse me, to serve just like Jesus served. <coughs> Excuse me. But that's not even the greatest example of serving others. The greatest example came soon after that, when Jesus submitted to death, even death on a cross. He served us by sacrificing himself for us, 
by substituting himself for us <clears throat> so that by his death we might live so that by his wounds we might be ransomed healed restored forgiven as the great hymn puts it jesus stoops to meet our greatest need namely to be reconciled to god to have our sins forgiven to have his righteous wrath averted from us poured out on someone else satisfied that that's our greatest need and christ stooped to serve us and to meet that greatest need by being our substitute and that's exactly what jesus calls us to not just ministers but all christians as as dietrich bonhoeffer famously said when christ calls a man he bids him come and die and by that he means die to his rights and his prerogatives and his personal priorities and his privileges we're called to crucify those in order that we might be able to minister to others elsewhere paul commands christians to have this mindset which was christ's mindset to quote consider others as more significant than yourselves and to consider their needs as more pressing than your own it should be obvious that that will take a great deal of humility to be able to serve in that way paul says in verse 19 of our passage that he has served the lord with all humility and i think we'll be in a better position to understand what humility looks like if we understand first its opposite something that we're a little bit more familiar with um, namely pride pride is having an overinflated opinion of oneself of your own greatness or your own worth or your own importance it's thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to we talk about people getting big heads or or um, inflated egos we we use that language of inflation when we talk about pride and so you can you can picture a balloon and what we naturally want to do in our pride is to puff ourselves up to 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 promote ourselves so th so that so that we're swollen almost to the point of bursting and then what happens is that in our greatness in our prominence our our balloon eclipses every other balloon and that's what we love that's what we really really like but humility is like letting the air out of your balloon okay it's and 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 there's there's different ways to do this as every um little boy knows you can take the air out of a balloon very loudly and uh, very publicly and demonstratively by popping it or by pulling the pulling the end of it so that the air rushes out of it and it makes this screeching noise and and there's a way to to be humble um by doing it in that loud and noticeable way but i'm talking about letting the air out of your balloon quietly with 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 no sound not drawing any kind of attention to yourself so that so that actually what you're into is is pumping air into other balloons other people's balloons that the analogy is breaking down but bottom line is that the the motto of the humble person is i must decrease and others must increase the passage is just loaded with examples of humility paul's humility the priority of serving others on the uh, on the part of the apostle paul is clearly seen in almost everything that he says but perhaps the clearest example is one that he gives towards the end of his speech where he addresses a common trap for for ministers for pastors something that is very much related to pride I'm talking about that thing called greed, the, the love of money. So, so much of a temptation is this, that one of the qualifications for an elder is that he must not be 
a lover of money. He must not be someone who is interested in, in gain and in dishonest gain. Um, in verses 33 to 35, Paul points to himself as an example of what it means to humbly die to personal rights and privileges in order to serve others. But right off the bat, you might be thinking, wait, wait a second, isn't this actually the opposite of humility? To be pointing to yourself as an example seems kind of prideful. That's, that's what we think when we consider that Paul might be pointing to himself for others to look at. And I know it seems that way, but ironically, the opposite is actually true. It would be much easier for the Apostle Paul, I believe, I'm, I'm confident of this, it'd be much easier for him, much more com comfortable for him not to put himself forward as an example. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians, and in that context, Paul is forced to kind of defend himself against a number of opponents that have come against him in that church, attacks on his authenticity. And, and so Paul has to defend himself, and as he's rehearsing his record, Paul is, is so self-conscious about it, he, he's even embarrassed to have to be doing that, and he says, listen to me, I, I sound like a madman here. So, obviously, Paul is not real comfortable with, um, with, with pointing out his, his accolades and, and the things that he's done. And you have to believe that Paul isn't crazy about doing that in our passage today. But he's doing so because he knows that it will serve these brothers that they will have a concrete, and that they've had a concrete example in their midst that they could look to and, you know, and, and be reminded of. Um, Paul will say elsewhere, he'll say, follow me, not because I'm great in and of myself, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And so Paul's putting himself forward, forward as an example because he's just, he's, he's proximate to them. He He's more, he's more um, relatable because he's spent time among them and they've observed all of this. They, they know all of this. Paul, throughout this speech, is, is always saying to them, you know this. You, you've seen this. And so he's doing this as a service to them. Paul is able to say in verse 33, I coveted no one's gold or silver or clothes. Paul labored hard the whole time he was there, not just to meet his own needs, but also to meet the needs of those who were with him. Of course, as a minister of the gospel, Paul had a right to be con compensated for the, the gospel ministry. After all, a workman is worthy of his wages, and it's not right to muzzle the ox while he's treading out the grain. Um, it is right and proper to give good gifts to those who, who teach you. Um, Paul will explain this in, in all of his letters. But my point simply here is to say that Paul is dying to his personal rights and his privileges in order to show that by working hard and serving others, he's able to set an example to the Ephesian Christians of what the Christian ministry and what the Christian life ought to look like. And this is what it looks like. It looks like, quote, helping the weak, as Paul will say in this passage. It, it looks an awful lot like Jesus. And you can see that Paul quickly diverts the elder's gaze from off of him and on to Jesus as he closes this speech. This is how Jesus lived and taught. Jesus himself said, Paul reminds them, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. He could have also mentioned this passage, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And that sets the pattern for all of Christian life and ministry. Listen, this is a message that we desperately need to hear because our basis instincts have us scurrying for self 
promotion and for gain and for glory, often at the expense of others. We're, we're, we're happy to squash others and to step on others in order to elevate ourselves. That's just naturally what our bent is. But the gospel calls us to go against the grain of that inclination and to put our own rights and our own prerogatives and our own privileges to death, to crucify them, choosing instead to promote other people and to pursue their good and to seek to meet their needs ahead of our own. The Christian ministry is just full of landmines of pride and greed and self-promotion. These days, my social media timelines and feeds are, are full of pastors who are live streaming, not just weekly, but often daily services or devotions or whatever. In many ways, I'm very grateful for this, and, and I'm excited about how the Lord might use that. And I just expect that there's a multitude of people uh, that will be saved through the gospel that is just going forth, saturating the social media airwaves, so to speak. And no doubt, all of these pastors have very great motives. They want to encourage the people. They want to be a blessing to people during these difficult times. That's wonderful. I'm just pointing out that even in this, even in something so wonderful and so needful and so helpful, even in this, there is a huge temptation for the man of God to, to relish the, the publicity, to pursue his own platform and to promote his own brand, to put all kinds of stock in the number of views and the number of likes and all of the rest. In, in other words, there's huge potential here um, for the man of God to feed his own flesh and his own pride. But the essence of the Christian life and the Christian ministry is exactly the opposite. The first mark of faithful service and faithful ministry in the kingdom of God is humbly serving. It's crucifying the serving of self in order to serve the Lord by serving others. The second mark of a faithful ministry is sobbing. Sobbing. I don't know if you noticed, but these verses are soaking wet. They, they're, they're puddles of tears all over this passage. In verse 19, um, in verse 31, in verse 37... Those latter waterworks there in verse 37 have to do with Paul's departure. And they certainly testify to the depth of the relationship that Paul had built with these men and with this church over the course of two and a half, three years of ministry. So that their parting was such sweet sorrow. And verse 37 seems like a scene out of a Hallmark movie. There's, there's much weeping. There's all kinds of hugging, which literally is translated as falling on his neck and even kissing. But here's the crazy part. These are all dudes. And, and these are not a bunch of soy boys and beta males, okay? These are man's men. That's why I didn't mind telling you how I struggled so much watching Toy Story because real men cry. Now, Luke explains in verse 38 that the prospect that they would never get to see Paul's face again, this side of heaven, is what really contributes to their tears. But when you take all of this together, you can see that in the Christian life, in the Christian ministry, there are deep emotions attached to deep relationships. The other day, my wife told me that she did a video chat with one of her best friends um, whom she hadn't seen for for three weeks now because well you know any anywho jamie said that when her friend popped up on the screen that it and, and she saw her face that it almost made her burst out in tears because it made her realize how much she missed seeing her face and being with her 
And that's a mark of faithfulness. When, when these moments are filled with such strong emotion, because they are backed with such a depth of relationship that have been cultivated in the cause of Christ and in the church. That is such a beautiful thing. And I expect that, that many of you have experienced something similar and have brought, been brought into a similar reminder of just how much the body of Christ means to you at this time. Something has gone drastically wrong when a pastor and a congregation can part ways after, say, three years, just a few years together, if they can part ways with just a good riddance rather than a tear-filled goodbye. The Christian ministry calls for such relational investment that when some party must depart for whatever reason, it can't be done without feeling like a piece of your heart has just been ripped out of you. But I want you to notice that sobbing didn't just mark the end of Paul's ministry to the Ephesians. Rather, sobbing saturated the whole thing. Look again at verse 18 and 19. Paul is talking about how he, how he lived among them the whole time from the first day until the last. And part of what marked that ministry, Paul says in verse 19, is tears. He says something similar in verse 31, that for three years he did not cease night and day to admonish everyone with tears. His admonitions to the, to the members of that congregation were bathed in tears. And what's going on here? Is, is Paul just more emotionally fragile than the average man? No. No. I would submit to you that it is because Paul is more aware than the average bear of the deadly seriousness of the task that is before him, the task to which he has been called, to the task to which we have been called. The Christian ministry, you, you understand, deals with matters of life and death. We're talking about the difference between heaven and hell, an eternity spent enduring the wrath of God against sin, or an eternity of glory and bliss in the presence of Christ. The enemies of the gospel are plentiful and they are powerful. They're, they're wolves, as we'll see later in this passage. They're fierce. And, and they're, they're not going to spare the flock if it depends on them. There is danger at every turn. That is why so many modern ministry models fall so short. It's all, these days, it's all about being hip and cool and comfortable and relatable. It's all about disarming people with, with coffee and lights and, and music and humor. And these elements are seen as indispensable if you want to have a successful ministry in the eyes of, of many people. But the Apostle Paul is concerned not with having a successful ministry in, in the terms that we describe them, but he's concerned with having a, a faithful ministry. And one of the indispensable marks of a faithful ministry is sobbing. He admonishes people with tears. And, and that pairing is essential. Admonishment with tears. No doubt at some point in your life you've been admonished without tears. You've just had the straight up admonition. And it was basically a cold, detached, thou shalt not. And what kind of effect did that have on you? You Likely it's the case that you either withered under that or you rebelled against that. But have you ever been the recipient of a, a tear-filled admonition? Have you ever been admonished with tears? When you know that, that the person that, that was approaching you was, was telling you the truth about yourself, when you knew that that person deeply loved you and was so concerned about you and was so concerned about your choices that that person was actually crying as he or she was calling you back home. Well, that is powerful. And that's what it means 
That's what it truly means to speak the truth in love. And that's something, friends, that you can't fake. It can't be faked. You know if someone genuinely loves you or not. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that there can't be any laughter in the Christian life. I'm not saying that at all. If I was saying that, I would be a total hypocrite. But I am saying that I fear that we're just far too flippant in the light of the fact that eternity is on the line. And every second of every day, there are people who are entering a Christless eternity where only torment awaits. President Trump has, has said that he hopes that one of, the, one of the outcomes of this crisis that we're facing globally, he's, he's hoping that one of the, the things that will persist even after this crisis is over is that the handshake, of which apparently he's not a big fan of, the handshake will go into extin extinction. It'll go the way of the dodo bird. Now, I happen to disagree with them, okay? I hope that when this is all over, that the handshake returns, and not only the handshake, but the hugs and the kisses and all the rest. But I'm praying, I am praying this about, here, here's my hope at the end of this, that one of the outcomes of all of this is that folks will have a much more serious approach to life and death. We are in the West, far too flippant. And my generation, who has never experienced any kind of difficulty, any kind of struggle or trial, we, we're we just so, we, we have what they're called first world problems. We're so flippant and casual. We make mountains out of molehills. And, and one of the good things that's coming out even now is that people are understanding the seriousness of life and death. And I pray that that sort of sobriety would continue even after the danger is gone. And what we need then is serious men and serious ministries, serious churches who, who have ministries and messages that match the seriousness of the stakes. I'll let the Puritan Richard Baxter summarize. He, he did so way better than I could ever. In his classic book, The, the Reformed Pastor, which is actually a, a wonderful exposition of this passage in Acts chapter 20. But Baxter writes this. We must be serious, earnest, and zealous in every part of our work. Our, our work requires greater skill and especially greater life and zeal than any of us bring to it. It is no small matter to stand up in the face of a congregation and to deliver a message of salvation or damnation as from the living God in the name of the Redeemer. It is no easy matter to speak so plainly that the most ignorant may understand us and so convincingly that the contradicting cavillers may be silent. The weight of our matter condemns coldness and sleepy dullness. We should see that we be well awakened ourselves and our spirits in such a plight as may make us fit to awaken others. If our words be not sharpened and pierced not as nails, they will hardly be felt by stony hearts. <clears throat> to, to speak slightly and coldly of heavenly things is nearly as bad as to say nothing of them at all. <coughs> Excuse me. Friends, the marks of a faithful ministry, indeed the marks of a faithful Christian life, include serving and sobbing. May the Lord equip us and strengthen us to live that sort of knee-scraped and tear-stained life for the good of others and for the glory of Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless you.